favorite uh, Chennai. Uh, through that experience, we find that people are interested to learn science and uh, get into science. But only thing is they reach out is a problem. Yeah. So thanks for introducing uh, in intensified its activities and by way of getting into the uh, the literacy movement, the total literacy movement, Tamil Nadu took care of take care of it and uh, was expanded throughout the Tamil Nadu and now Tamil Nadu Science Forum is established in all districts. So we have district unit, branches, and state levels. So we are running some magazines, couple of magazines only in English, and then another one in English. Apart from that, now it has been reorganized and working with six different verticals. One is a, basically it starts with science propagation, still it is continuing. I am part of the science, PSL is part of the science propagation. Apart from science propagation, we do the working on environment and the, uh, development. We develop, we work on the science propagation, we, uh, we release science magazines, and we are working on the gender equality, particularly women in science. So there are six different verticals we are working on it, uh, education and health, which are all areas. Um, I, uh, I want to make use of this opportunity to uh, call upon you to become a member of Tamil Nadu Science Forum and you can get into the activities, any of the activities you are you, you have interest. So with this, uh, let me ask uh, Dr. Pavid Rajan to introduce the speaker, then we'll go there. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Um, Science Forum uh, for inviting me here to share uh, these ideas. And I've been in this auditorium some years ago. Uh, so, first I've attended some uh, workshop on you know, computational cardiology. Uh, so, again, I'm coming here. It's a big uh, delight to come back here. It's also a bit daunting to address uh, irritations and all that because uh, this is mostly computational work. So, uh, you know, happy to receive some feedback. So, let me summarize the essence of my talk. You know, the second question and elaborate yeah, yeah. Words the talk. So there's a lot of interest in neuroscience and brain science. There's a lot of buzz, right? And every day you see newspapers about the discovery of some new new drug for some you know, disease or some breakthrough about some brain disorder and all that. Right. So there's a lot of people want to know how does brain work and how come it's so intelligent and all this. The thing is that sometimes I feel that it is uh, unnecessarily made more complicated than what it actually is. Because remember that uh, neuroscience is a part of biology, and biology is a very empirical field. It's a very descriptive field, right? So if you believe in you know collecting what are observations, people, you know, physicists people call it stamp collection, very important. So and uh, so you accumulate all the observations and then you report it and you document it and all that. Whereas you have sort of the test of theory issue. So uh, if you take a data centric approach to anything, it will be very complicated. You can make a simple point and look extremely complicated. If you take a very data centric approach. But whereas if you understand the right underlying principles, even the most complex things will look quite simple. I think brain is no different. Right? So if you do that, I think brain also looks quite simple. And if you will get a better grip on how this object works. And uh, therefore, all this understanding will translate into better treatments for brain disorders because there's a serious crisis when it comes to uh, clinical applications, medical 
success during that. I don't know what uh, Blue Chef has done, but you know, if you just look at the people around us and when they what happens when they face some, you know, disorder, it's a serious problem. So we'll have greater success in that area. So this is the essence of my question. Right, thank you. So the thing is, as, you, as I was saying, there's a lot of hype that's created about uh, neuroscience and brain uh, in popular media. For example, you might be hearing sentences like this. The number of neurons in the brain are more <laughs> That is I don't know. Okay. The number of neurons in the brain is more than the number of uh, stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So maybe so Milky Way galaxy has one estimate to generate the billion stars. Right, brain number is hundred billion neurons. Actually, the recent estimates are different. Don't create that number of twenty five billion neurons. The point is, so what? Right, I mean, body has thirty seven trillion cells. So what? I mean, how does what is it? When you go to Marina Beach, it will have so many different number of sand particles. We don't say it is a complex object. What kind of a statement is that? Where do we where do we people make such comparisons? So the brain is another example like this, another another gem that you find in popular media. The brain is the most complex object in the universe. Complex object on the planet, I can say by that from a complex object in the universe. From how many objects have you seen in the universe? Right, we haven't even gone beyond the moon. So object means we think of some small tiny thing, right? How can you assess the complex of an object of right? which is on some other planet or some other you know, solar system, no, sir. So, but it's like professional scientists and psychologists talk like this. It's like a two-year-old saying, I have the greatest mom in the whole universe. So something it's like a child childish. People don't scientists doesn't talk like that. So why is there so much hype? The thing is there are many reasons. They can begin with social political reasons, right? For example, we're in the era of a big funding, big projects. That unless you have a big project and you are not doing great science, that, that, that's like right, popular industry. If you have measured by the number of funding, you can like, go any idea, we'll tell you that. Uh, so, when you have a lot of funds, when you have a lot of funding, you need to show that your stuff, our stuff is coming out of the research, right? So, simplest way to present that and project that is to collect a lot of data and you know, show it in colorful pictures and publish it. And if I do, uh, the lot of work is going on. So, and then the lot of, uh, you know, Projection and all that will give you more funding in the vicious, uh, vicious cycle that is closed. So that's one reason why this hype. You need to have the hype to get the big things going. But a more fundamental academic reason is that remember, neuroscience is a branch of biology. And biology is all about from predominantly the very observation. Let's begin with the early days of biology, the grandfather of Jerome Bob, so we can get the right to our own through his fluid uh, microscope. Right, we saw these microorganisms in his blue microscope, and you know, there was no micro gap, so we had hand draw or whatever you see. He, he did this. And remember that, I mean, no bacterium looks like that. It looks like some, some wild piece from, you know, some science fiction movie, you know, where you depict some intervention of the piece from another planet or something like that. Right, so it's, it's very obvious, it's very clear, but I mean, that's not how real, but it looks like. But one thing that gives a test of the observation nature of, you know, biology. Right, only again, the advanced one doing work uses a crude microscope. Now we have fancy gadgets like in our MRI, MRI, CAT, CAT, and so on and so forth. You take photographs, take all pictures, and then, you know, so, 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 and then you try to make sense of it in your vision. Okay, so uh, this aspect of biology is this, uh, there's a lot of criticism of this object. A very interesting, hilarious article by Gary Razakne, right, in molecular cell, I think, cancer cell. It's cited that can a biologist fix a radio or what I learned while studying in photosynthesis. Actually, it's a, it's a real article, I'm not making it up. I mean, so the article goes something like this. Suppose you ask a biologist uh, to study how a radio works, they have no idea what's there. The biologist doesn't have any idea about how it works. So, they would, in biology, you want to study something, you take, you, you order a lot of samples of the system and then take some measurements, you know, like lots of cells or lots of tissue samples or something like that. So if you want to study a radio, they would order a lot of uh, intercepted code samples, thousands of them. And then you want to study that. What do you do with it? Uh, so you, all things being equal, you change only one thing. You can see what I'm to explain. That's how biology works, right? So you take this thing, power it out, and then, okay, it's not problem. We have to come to function as it takes in the beginning with structural analysis. What does it mean? You describe the structure. So I look at this and say, okay, there are this black, uh, you know, cubed things that they have. They have mostly eight legs, but some have you know, six legs and silver legs, and some are uh, kind of uh, brown cylindrical things, and some have some cylinders have stripes on them, some have six stripes, some have three stripes. This goes on and on and on. 
takes a lot of time to describe this in great detail, right? So that you know, the whole research lab might take ten years to describe all this in terms of the CD and all that. So that completes a structure analysis phase. Then it will come to function analysis. So what you have to power it up and then pull up one component at a time and see what happens to the output of the PC, that is radio, sound, which is still produce sound. So they keep on doing it, and uh, normally if you just pull out some resistor, nothing much will happen. But uh, suppose by mistake you pull out some wire which is carrying power in from the power line into the PCB. So then you completely stop the sound. And that becomes a major discovery. Right? Now, this is not a good thing. We will take off on how well the research works. And written by a professional biologist. So then that becomes a major discovery, and the postdoc gets a lot of NIH funding. And, you know, currently positions in Harvard and Stanford and all these things. Uh, and people went to the So uh, so that's how it works, right? So but where are the two if you ask an engineer of this, right? Well, how does what does it even mean to understand how a radio works? Well, a couple of things. First of all, you need to have an idea that this has been for like a career. And then it comes to communication with the carrier wave and the message writing software. And there must be a circuit material circuit which relates to the thickness of the carrier wave. So you have to curate to the thing. And once you pick it up, you demoderate it, amplify it, and take it to the speaker. And that's all. That's very good. If you don't have this broad picture, if you just obsess with the architectural details of the, the circuit, it will be a nightmare. It will take on, it will go on for centuries. But that's what seems to be happening with Theorus and Right. So, so, so and another thing is the reason why there's so much hype, right? This kind of approach is so strong in neuroscience. We are living in an era of dictator. We are living in an era in, in the revolution of science, history of science. Their data is worshipped for its own sake. We don't have to worry about the theory can come later or never. Right? Data is good enough and so we worship it. But because of that, well, it's even considered one of the four branches of pillars of science in big data. So because of that, we have a lot of data coming from various aspects of uh, brain. For example, you know, molecular and different kinds of proteins and their, their properties. So once again, I went to postdoc after my engineering and PhD in engineering. The HOD of the Education Department, uh, when somebody introduced me, they said, you know, this man worked on astral and receptor for 20 years. That's one body. Right? And I was like, sort of shock of my life. And because in the end, nobody works on one molecule for 20 years. So I didn't know anything about biology at the time. That was a shock. I was very first entry into the thing was such a shock. So like that, we have data about various molecules and then interactions with all that. Or we have tons of data about single neurons. The neuron is like a cell with a lot of wires sticking out. So you have detailed upper uh, morphology details, you know, how long, how the thickness of fibers. The catalysts have been published. And all uh, you have behavioral data. I mean, if you ask a person to look at some way, scan the image, how does the ice move? Well, you can have tons of data. Uh, system level, I mean, how what is the architecture of the visual system, the architecture of the auditory system, so on. So the immense amount of data in all of this science, right? Some examples of neurons, right? Neuron is not some singular uh, cell type. There's a lot of variation, diversity in neural morphologies. You have atlas of cells, which is neural morph with the of uh, single cells. So once you have understand single cells, and not understand, once you collect data of single cells, you start collecting data about networks. So we've got various networks of neurons, right? So, uh, so then in the real brain, in human brain, each neuron is connected to about uh, 10,000, 1,000, 10,000 other neurons. Uh, they itself has 100 billion or 85 billion neurons. It's very hard to work out the entire network of the human brain. But people have done that for smaller organisms, like, for example, this worm called CLD, popularly called nematode, which has only about 302 neurons, which has up to 6,000 or so connections. So that's been well worked out and uh, that's very successful. So people are trying to do the same thing for human uh, brain. This is called the Connectome Project. There's a very nice book by Sebastian Stevens, I the Connectome. So at the level of boom brain, it's very hard to work out the entire connectivity of a three neuron and an eight neuron to eight neuron, which is 100 billion neuron network. So, which is absurd also, right? So people are doing that more at the uh, gross level in the region to region. What are the things going on those things? So the, the grand you know, goal of all this effort is to work out the entire graph structure of the brain. This is called the connectome project. You know, my, my argument is not my question. Uh, we don't even have a, have a basic understanding of the reason behind the gross anatomy of the brain, the basic theory of uh, brain's anatomy. Why does human brain or mammalian brain have two hemispheres? Why, why have why each hemisphere has four groups? Why is cerebellum sticking outside and not inside? Right? Uh, why do we have the central hub called thalamus? Right? All information is supposed to the central hub. 
before it reaches various particle targets. Um, why is there this sheet of cells called cortex which uh, surrounds the entire brain cortex? Right? So, so, some basic logic loop that uh, there's an optimization condition, basic cause, which shape brain to become like this through evaluation. We don't, we, we don't even understand that. Once we understand that, we get detailed data from you know, metrodomes of actual brain. We'll put it into, you know, into some kind of framework. We don't understand that if you keep on collecting data, it looks unnecessarily complicated, which is what is happening today. So, because of this, we are having a situation where we have tons of data and very little theory. It's uh, data strong and very weak, right? And that makes it like a, some kind of indigestion of. Yeah. Uh, so, if one uh, like takes a system, uh, if one models the thing as a system and uh, like tries to simulate different architectures of the thing, uh, can one sort of show that the current architecture is the most optimal or, or is? Very often. No, so so because I mean once you so the two things, one is function and one is structure. And here in that third in terms of only structure, the overall shape of it. When it comes to modeling, that's what people do. I mean you take the uh, rats uh, you know rats function, right, in some way because they focus it or what is it doing the space or something. You model the corresponding circuits for that function, and there ends a matter. Then you do the same thing for a monkey, but that's a whole different story. We don't try to put things together and look at more underlying deep common laws. That's a problem. So it's, it's very fragmented. Okay, so because of this, we have a data strong theory weak kind of situation. Uh, so to understand exactly put put uh, current data science in historical perspective, it's very easy to do that to compare this with the history of physics or history of astronomy. So if we go back two thousand years. Uh, Right, uh, and look at the next day, Ptolemy's work, right, Ptolemy's volume in terms of the Ptolemy. So, Ptolemy, I mean, the, like people in those days, he thought that uh, Earth is the center of the universe and then all the next operation. And then he would plot their orbits and we have to make up this epicycle, concept called epicycle, uh, cyclic exist to you know, capture the planetary orbit. It was very complicated, but I mean, that, that's uh, what we did. And fast forward like 1500 years after that. We come to the time of uh, hypergravity. At the time of hypergravity, already people were, uh, you know, there the estimates of the timing of uh, eclipses and all that were off by a couple of days. So, which was a big thing because people were uh, predicting whether a king can go for a war or something based on eclipses and all that. So, uh, so they wanted to have more accurate estimates of eclipse. Uh, so, in terms of accuracy, what did, what did he do? He didn't worry about the totally wrong world, right? That was prevailing at that time. He just uh, what exactly he did exactly what the big data guys do today. But get more data. Right? He said that instead of uh, observing your heavens uh, once every day, observe it many times through the night. Right? So in case you are sampling it. So get more data. And then fit your technology time series more accurately and you get better, better prediction, get more accurate prediction. So the accuracy improved. The world flow view was perfect. In fact, Tagapa has world view. Earth is still the same. Sun and moon go around, around the other. But other plants go around the sun. Why? It's a political compromise with the church. Right? So so thing is it's numerically it is more accurate than before. But uh, the paradigm as a basic note is it has it. Right? So that's what will happen if you just keep on collecting the data and take a very data centric approach. You might get some accuracy in the short term, right? For a few systems. I don't have the universality that we would like to see in a good field. So uh, whereas now then bring in Kepler. But Kepler was also looking at all this and he didn't like the models, the original models model. He lived the life of poverty I and mean, creation, right? So, uh, so he was is a strongly influenced by Greek uh, traditions of geometry and all. So people that Greeks were in big love of you know, geometry, right? So they were they thought what is a geometry and like the force fit the geometric forms into the physical world and all. So he was very fond of this uh you know regular polyhedra, so when five of them. And we had the same construction whereby I uh, start with the uh, sphere and then circumscribe it with one of the regular polyhedra. Then circumscribe dark with another sphere and keep doing this until we come to a final sphere. So the radius of the spheres that you will get are supposed to be proportional to the orbit radius of the known planets. Right? And uh, it's approximately correct, but uh, he himself gives up on that idea because he realized that circle is not a good model uh, for the planetary orbits. 
They were mixed up on the idea that it's probably a lips and after that, you know, it's being kept in small. So that means that's like a one step beyond the big data, where you see some deep patterns in there, and they're very set. Then comes Newton and, you know, looks at his patterns, and he says that there's some kind of a diversity force acting, it's a centralized force, and then, right, it's decreasing with this center, you know, square form, and so on. So all that, but with that, you have this design and devaluation. So it is called Newton's uh, universal law of gravitation, right? It's not called one model for Earth and Saturn and Jupiter or something. It's called universal law of gravitation. Suddenly, from big data to data patterns, we have arrived at universal laws, right? Whereas that's not uh, what happens in universal laws. Because look at this, uh, it's like a Bible of universal science. This was principles of universal science, written by a Nobel laureate and uh, Canada is a Nobel laureate, a bunch of other famous neuroscientists. Now, uh, this is a British uh, neurologist called David Balfour. Uh, he has made a joke about it. It's a wonderful book, really great reading. When I joined postdoc, uh, first thing my mentor did, because he knew that uh, I didn't know anything So he said, uh, he just gave me this copy that was fourth edition, fourth year, this sixth edition. He said, just sit and read this cover to cover without leaving a single sentence. Okay, I won't give you a research project in the second read. So after one month, I was doing only this, you know, at work and at home. Brilliant book. Right, but Walcott makes a joke about it. He says, Look, if it's a book on principles, why is it getting fatter and fatter with every edition? The principles always are compact, meaningless. Right, and then once you have the principles, they have that elaboration, the external application system that can, you know, that, that can get infinite. But how can principles uh, be, uh, get bigger and bigger? So we don't have principles here. Right, what is talked about in the book is not really the principle that ultimately what will be the principles of it. So, just as Newton has become principia, it is great. It has not wait for centuries and all that. Like, you know, maybe next 10, 20 years, somebody can write that compact set of brain principles. Right? So, first few chapters of that will be going to be and so on. So that will be part one of the book. And part two is applied to the system of the system and the you know, species of the species. And it's like this government same principles. And how beautiful it would be. Right? So, we don't have to flavor at all. Problem is, we are not even going to go to a big conference like. Associated with neuroscience conference, uh, where 30,000 neuroscientists attend, with students and faculty and PIs. It's a huge community, right? Uh, but still, we don't have these principles in, in our hands. So, we, I don't know how they can solve the problem, but this is how I look at it. I think this is the problem. If this problem can be solved, what a great outcome will come from. Okay, so I'm not uh, some lone voice, you know, crying like this. A lot of big people are going to talk about this. For example, yes, Ramachandran, the Chennai Origin and neuroscientist uh, who is at VC San Diego. He also said we are a paradise state in Europe. And then uh, Patricia Churchline, the neuroscientist and neurophilosopher, she also says, you know, there are no neurology, there are no good ones. So she has written a very beautiful book called The Compilation Brain, along with Sejnos, Kevin Sejnos. So I mean, she is saying that. So obviously she knows the subject and she knows what she's talking about. Right? So, so this is how it is in the brain theory, right? And so look at reduction. So another reason why it is so complicated is you know biology is very reductions. Because what is the reductions of here? You try you want to explain everything in terms of the smallest functions. There's insistence that everything has to explain in terms of smallest functions, so that molecule and gene level or cell. Right? Cell is considered like a kind of a metabolic cow or whatever. So everything has to be explained in terms of cell. But uh, we don't make that mistake in engineering. We don't need that. Because we know in engineering and physics that at every level there is an independent set of laws that can express at that level and they're self consistent. You don't have to report to the smaller scales to give a law at a you know, level of scientific. So, for example, if you are studying fluid flow, you don't include is basically a bunch of molecules, but you don't even mention molecules when you're studying fluids. All right? So, there's a, you know this abstraction for fluid and the equations rigorously described right, at that level of abstraction. And then you can design the aircraft in each level. But I can also do molecular simulation uh, for aircraft wind. That would take me some half a century, right? So the aircraft will never fly. So we, we don't do that in engineering. Right? Uh, so because of all this, we look at brain theory too. And this is a picture of shards of brain theory. Right? We have, for example, you know, very detailed five display developments. Okay, that's a whole huge field of software that we have to install. They're spiking neuron models. And again, huge field. Uh, that is the system scale, and more people from physics and you know, all that. Uh, there's a whole field which is because basic statistical systems, it's a large system, right? So people can apply those objects. That's a whole line of it. 
Uh, electromagnetic field is operating, right? And it's an electrical system with currents flowing and so on. So it's on that. Your electromagnetics is mostly about a very highly data centric, you know, data analysis. So uh, neural networks, garbage networks apply to play a lot of work. Oscillator is I mean, I, you can have as many as you like, you know, but it's small uh, approaches which don't have much uh, applicability. So that's how it is, you know, it's very fragmented. Right, you nice if this and integrate it to some, you know, uh, there's always different components can be combined or other elements can be connected, right, to some kind of a grand and unified thing. So, because of this, you see a disproportionate development, there's a lot of data and, you know, the physics is understood by those single cells, but when it comes to systems, there are large scales, things get very great. Right, we don't have a good theory of a single brain structure, right, uh, maybe cortex, if you take a small patch of the cortex. Especially with these patches in primary sensory areas. This is like really lowest level in the hierarchy. You might have a reasonable case when you can explain how the primary visual cortex works, how the primary smoker sensory cortex, such cortex works, and so on. But otherwise, beyond that, it gets very big. So, because of these problems, you take any major brain disorder, uh, uh, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, ALS, uh, I mean, name it, right? You don't have a good theory. Because if you want to understand schizophrenia, it's not enough to have lots of data about schizophrenia. Because schizophrenia is a, is a cosmetic disorder. So you need to first understand what is cosmetic, how is cosmetic encoded in the brain. We don't have theory of that. So what does it mean to understand uh, schizophrenia? And if you don't understand, how do you fix it? Right? I mean, just by shooting the dark, you know, taking pot shots every time by an empirical, an empirical way, you try to fix it. But I mean, without understanding the color, it's only by using some some umbro, some what is it doing? How can you fix it? We can't fix it. We are not able to fix it right now. We make some progress because uh, there isn't a single brain disorder. Uh, so we go infectious diseases, where there is a germ and you have to fill it with some drug. If, drugs, if you have the drug, you're done. That disease is pure. Or take a surgical condition, like there's a tumor, you remove it surgically and put it. Right? Uh, other than these kinds of situations, take any brain disorder, major brain disorder. You can't say you can cure it today. You manage it. Right, you, you you give some level of comfort and you know give patients some longer life and things like that. But nothing like you know malaria or something where you have a, a diagnosis and give it drug and you're done. Right, so that's a, because these are all network diseases, also with a, you know some impairment in the network. So unless you understand the network properly, you cannot really fix it, and you can see it happening. Okay, so the thing is not only that. On top of that, treatments that people give sometimes. I'm just giving a handful of examples. Uh, we, we they work, but we don't know how they work or why they work. All right. So, for example, take vagal stimulation. So, vagal now is a part of your autonomic nose system. So, this is a part of the system that automatically controls the body. So, there's one called one branch of it called a parasympathetic nose system. This is a nerve inside that nose. So, this nerve is uh, is stimulated, electrically stimulated. Put a electrode on it and then electrically stimulated. That is used for epilepsy. Which is the problem with the cortex and synchronous and uh, uncontrolled activity of the cortex? My depressive disorder, again, that's a whole different sort of system. Right? Uh, it works, so we, we do it, but we don't know why it works or how it works. But the problem is the same nerve, if you activate it too hard, because uh, it, it has tendency to slow down the heart. Okay, so if you activate it too much, it will completely stop the heart. It's dangerous. That's another adverse effect from nausea to cardiac arrest. Okay, so it's all empirical. It works, so we do it. Uh, so look at the Wikipedia article, what it is saying. As of 2017, it was understood about exactly how the Lebanon situation operates and what it's like. Mood means for depression, which is another correct It works, we don't know why it works. Okay, so look at uh, lithium uh, for bipolar disorder. Again, it came in the millimeter. All right, so you give it, uh, it works. So we don't have a good theory of bipolar disorder. Why are there this oscillation between mania and depression? Right, so um, we need to have a story, we need to have a conceptual framework by which we can describe all these things uh, very consistently and comfortably. We don't have so all that we have is our observational data and some thumb rules by which you can read. So, uh, I mean, my favorite book for this is uh, by Joel Paris, that's called Prescriptions for the Mind. So it's a book on psychiatry, a set of, uh, a set of psychiatric drugs. He says that in about 22, there are also these. Uh, that's what it is, conditions are being discovered. With these areas, it would help many, not most of the test patients. Okay, so that is one step. 
Another patient says, one should not, but also keep in mind that we do not know how most of the drugs used for mental disorders. Okay. And the second, most conditions. I'm not saying some exam. No, we have, we know mostly, but this drug is giving some problem. This condition is still, no, sorry. Most. Right? It's entirely possible, however, that also the neuroscience may lead to further breakthroughs and problems. People are only worried about uh, you know, some drug which you may solve from miraculous. As a, as a theoretician, as an engineer, I'm not satisfied with that. I first want to understand how it works. Because, so the various, you know, there are cases where you find some drug is uh, you know, in the market and very soon the drug is withdrawn because you need to find that it's, it's no good, it has side effects. So, this is what happens if it's all in a hit and trial kind of an approach, right? We want to go to the bottom of it, understand it. And then I'll securely develop a drug which will have reliable effects. And this hit and trial effect is only okay at a very crude early stage of science. After that, you become very, I mean, imagine sending a rocket uh, to, you know, a solar mission, or this year, one or something, where you just keep trying, okay, I'll put my rock at this angle, see if it goes, otherwise. I mean, you can't go to the point and make a long drop with it by simply trying the time to approach it. So, uh, you need to go to the bottom at some point. Of now, this is the situation, but I mean, I'll give some uh, certain examples of people I've seen. Because some of uh, many of the researchers forget that we lose touch with uh, you know, the social reality, what we see in the day to day. I'll give a couple of examples. So, once I was going on a ferry in San Francisco Bay, and I saw this woman with a book on some European book in her hand, and I said, I asked, Are you interested in neuroscience? Are you a neuroscientist? She said, No, no, no I'm not a neuroscientist. Apparently, her husband uh, was a stroke 18 years ago. Since then, he was confined to the wheelchair. And they have two daughters, and both, uh, you know, she only brought them up and now is in college and married. Now, she was running the entire household on her shoulders. Right? And uh, so, this is the state of, this is in San Francisco, and she seems to be living in Vietnam. But that's the state of the medicine. Right, so it's not enough to have fancy equipment which will give you scans of the brain. Then let me tell you, this is a problem in all its facets, but what is the point if you cannot cure it? All right, so uh, take another example. Mental, I'm giving you some hard examples, but it's a very common example which you'll see in my own mental retardation. Uh, it was uh, maybe not so brilliant today, but in the previous edition, I would see it. And I remember one of the little uh, who didn't study beyond both standards, but no matter. The word mental retardation itself is, is not politically correct or something like that. Who cares? Right? It's a fact. It's a fact of life. So the person is, is not scientifically aerobic and they live like literally a vegetable all the time. So what can neuroscience do for that person? Nothing. Right? So uh, brain injury, road accident, we see all the time. I know uh, somebody in a road accident, there's a profound change in personality. The person lives on like that, you know, they kind of understand anything. So, point is, I want a theory which will make sense out of this conditions and really actually bring about a concrete substantial change. Right? I don't want to just write papers, but this is a, this is a problem that I'm seeing with it. And can you really help me go to the bottom of it? If you have a good theory, you can have a good explanation. If you are just you know, pulling around, giving lots of facts, and other than you haven't gotten to go the bottom of it. Okay, so what is my solution? What are the solutions? Everybody can complain about the problem. I think debate is we have achieved success in engineering. You can look at every branch of engineering. There's a foundation of solid mathematics, which is in turn is rests on a foundation of physics. The comparative physics. Right? There's a, there's a mathematical framework is a conceptual framework. Everything rests on top of it. Right? If you can create that for neuroscience, I think that will be completely turned around in the field. Uh, so you can add all this, your, uh, you know, your wizardry of, you know, pharmacotherapy and biotechnology, and biomedical devices, all that you can add to this. But if you have this as a foundation, I think it is suddenly going to be revolutionized for clinical practice and how they are able to treat disorders. This is my basic suggestion. So this and uh, so in my lab, we try to, uh, uh, so how do you give one time? Please let me know. Okay, I will wrap up. So, the thing is, uh, we want to build a model of the whole brain. Because the problem with neuroscience is, in the name of specialization, everybody focuses on one tiny thing and you know, go deeper and deeper and deeper. We lose the big picture, and it's a very common problem. I mean,
Malaysia whole country almost is half, right? I mean, let us first figure out amygdala, then we think about home, something like that. Right? So, uh, so whereas if you look at the whole brain, this is a cotton picture of the brain. This is a separate input streams going up, some other output streams coming down, and both the meet in this big prefrontal area, which is like a decision making area in the brain. And then there are three, so you think of this as a long pathway, that is going all over the sensory input to motor. And then there are three major uh, kind of bilayer loops, uh, which are peripheral, basal, and hypothalamus. Anatomically, it's all very complicated, but if you look at the architecture, it's so simple. So if you can capture this, we have understood mostly the uh, mammalian effects, right, the essence of it. So the idea is to create something like this, uh, not 1 billion neurons, but maybe 10 million neurons. That will be the prototype model. We should have all the brain structure things. So what we have done so far is done work in visual system, some understanding of language and space, basically we are putting other uh, some aspects of hippocampus, motor function, eye movements, uh, some of so we are trying to fill up the pieces, right? And the idea is that you know for it. Uh, uh, to put all those pieces together and build a whole thing. That's the plan. So, to this end, I divided the lab into various teams. Each team works on one aspect of thing, and uh, first just focus on that. And there are a lot of interacts among the teams, so they learn from each other and try to build the whole thing. So, also, I think this book called Image and the Brain. The idea is that uh, I think so the, the two huge communities and the because of uh, this communication gap, they don't talk as much as they should. Because if you talk about uh, talk to the physicists and engineers, it's all in bio jobs and they get to talk. Right? So you need to make it simple. Give the essence of it to this so you see the see the math problem. Similarly, if you talk about the mathematical concepts of biologists or a doctor, they get to talk. They need to present the basic ideas in a language that they can relate to. So I think this book tries to come from to both these communities. But the, these two communities have to come together, find some common ground. And actually, uh, first of all, if it is a problem. Right, and then the right problem, not the problem is not to create one more fancy technology to measure something which people haven't measured. No, problem is basic understanding of the principles, right? That's where the real problem So, there, if you understand, if you have the problem, you need to talk about it. So, I uh, talked a little bit about how we have done. So, this is a, a model of baseline which we developed over the last one and a half decades, right? New subject uh, of baseline. And uh, so yeah, part of this is damage, this part called substantial negative cause compact. This is damage, and this is called Parkinson disease. So because of damage to cells in the tiny part, which are the few lack of cells, of course. So people have, uh, the major symptoms that you see are primordiality, posture problems, and medication, slow movement, and like that. And not only that, if you look at, uh, so the thing is, any, any damage to basal and it's a very really high level of the of the brain. Uh, any, any damage here will show up in all the four major domains of brain function sensory motor function, cognitive function, affective or emotional function, and autonomic there is a function of the internal organs. That's very devastating because of this final loss. So, why does it happen like this? So, we try to we develop a model which can explain the you know, wide variety of both sensory motor and uh, cognitive functions, right? Uh, of, of, of this system and circuit, and what happens in the you know, disease condition. So we made some expansion of the current that we have. So based on we published a book, uh, so like a summary of all the studies on, on the system. So we also, this was Vignan's PhD thesis, uh, what we tried to show based on the experimental work is that the common underlying cause why cells in this part of the brain die is because of metabolic efficiency. It looks like uh, these cells are under major metabolic cells because they have, these are small cluster of cells. Uh, they send uh, outputs to very diverse targets and power targets in the brain and cause energy to transmit some signal across distances. So, because all the axons are very energy intensive because when you tra transmit a signal over a long distance, you have to keep on charging up a signal as, as it marches along. And that requires energy that has come from that cell. So, they are high metabolic cells and so they can easily go on. And it's surprising that everybody is not a Parkinson's patient or so something. Because the, 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 these cells are actually marked for them. So, uh, we could explain many uh, different pathologies uh, that you see in Parkinson's at molecular level, cell level, and network level. All of them could be explained using one common underlying factor, which is metabolic efficiency. Right? The, the difficulty in delivering adequate energy to these cells. Okay? So, so, based on this model that we have developed, 
uh, we are trying to now put the uh, entire Parkinson's therapeutics on a computational problem. Uh, in the sense, you know, when a PG patient goes to doctor now, the doctor inspects uh, the patient's performance and doctor gives them the monitor and gives certain ratings. This rating is called UPDRS score, impaired Parkinson's. So, whether well, it's very subjective because doctor is looking at the patient and doing the other things in computation. Whereas if you collect data, complete data from the patient about the gait pattern and the handwriting, the speech, the patient making performance, and all these things. And all that you can do it on a smartphone, which is what we are doing. We have a map And uh, so then you use the data to calibrate all of them. Then the model becomes like a virtual patient. Right? And whatever treatment you want to give to the patient, you simulate it on the model first and then give it to the patient. So it becomes uh, less invasive for the patient, less stressful for the patient. So which is what we will be collecting data from Ramchandra Hospital. Another area where we spend our time is the modern hippocampus. The hippocampus is called the GPS of the brain uh, because this is a part of the brain which uh, which encodes space and which uh, you know, creates a representation of the surrounding world, it's called spatial world. So in the 71, there's one group uh, headed by John O'Keefe uh, that found this kind of cells uh, in a part of the hippocampus. These are called clay cells because uh, so I'll show you a video from one of the research labs. So here is a rat. Uh, there is a record stuck inside its hippocampus. So it's running around the box. You see it on the top, right? So whenever it goes to that part of the box, that red ball indicates that the neuron is just high, getting activated briefly. So the neuron is getting activated briefly only when it goes to that part of the box. So, which means that neuron in the hippocampus of the animal encodes that little space, that location, like a pin code, by its own pin code for that part of the box. So, yes, that was discovered by John uh, and his group in 71. And more recently, in 2005, the Moser couple, um, Medrick and Edward uh, Moser, they discovered another cell, another kind of cell called a grid cell, which fires not at just one location, but a whole array of locations. And all these area locations form a nice periodic grid. And this grid happens to have an hexagonal structure. It's a very beautiful you know, uh, periodic cell. I guess brain is a very messy system. How do you get that kind of an order in the response patterns? Right, it's such a messy network, right? That can take people a lot, and these two groups are jointly about the whole price in So there's a lot of interest in to understand this system, this kind of what are called spatial cells of hypotensis. So we developed a model starting from about the 2015 also we started working on this system. And uh, this is a very simple model uh, which could show how you get red cells and red cells. And uh, this was uh, later extended to 3D navigation, 3D dimension space. You know, bats, a lot of data from bats. Uh, this is a collaboration with a group uh, in UC Berkeley, Michael Jackson's group. So uh, there also we could apply the same modeling approach and show similar kind of spatial cells in bats. This is published in Asia. And uh, similarly, in high movement space, also to find this cell. Um, more recently, Azra was doing her PhD on this. She could combine visual input and you know, what is called path integration, how you integrate our own self motion uh, to find position. So, using this kind of new network model, she was able to uh, explain the emergence of all the different spatial cells, you know, grid cells, grid cells, border cells, corner cells, object cells, object vector cells, object place cells. View cells, uh, object sensitive, and whole slew of cells, all found in hippocampus by various experimental labs. You see all of them emerging in the network, very simple, very natural model. Right? So, the point is very simple principles can be used to explain wide diversity of experiment observations. You don't need to make up a new story for every new observation. So, one more thing we've been focusing a lot on operating is uh, modeling neural oscillations. The thing is, a single neuron, lipid activity is a new neuron, looks like a bunch of spikes, uh, sharp fluctuations in voltage. So people have uh, been, been using, describing them using a series of beta functions. That is one way. Another way is to like, just look at the average firing rate and a couple of things. Uh, so, so that is called the rate code and spiking uh, is called the spike, the spike code. There's a third school of thought which believes that it shouldn't even go into the single neuron. Just look at the average activity of a bunch of neurons for the neuron ensemble. And then that signal will be a small signal, and it will just uh, go some more faster. So let us describe for instance, in terms of fluid on some, ensemble, just like fluid mechanics, where you only describe in terms of fluid elements, not at single molecules. You can also describe in terms of ensembles, right? 
So we are, I really like this approach, and uh, so we began modeling brain analysis and networks of oscillators. So here we made some uh, interesting uh, kind of coupling oscillators. Uh, so I think we'll skip some of this. In this, we're able to model brain analytics at large scale. This is the first step of that kind. Uh, so then we also began to use several circuit models. Uh, so we oscillate circuit models and couple them to, to describe locomotion rhythms of quadrupeds. Then also some work on vision, visual system uh, motion and uh, how we scan images with the hands and so on. We also make some work on modeling neurovascular coupling, that is, how do blood levels and neurons form tissue? Because, like any tissue, neurons also depend on blood or circuitry for the nutrients and oxygen. So, how do they talk to each other? So, so there, uh, there's an infinite amount of data about the biology and all that. So, we said, let us look at an engineering problem. So, basically, I have neurons and I have blood vessels, and an intermediate uh, set of cells called real cells. Uh, which takes different some neurons and pass them into blood vessels, and neurons dilate, release energy, uh, which is again taken by DLs and pass them into blood vessels. So DLs are like some kind of intermediary between the employee and the employer. Kind of. So, uh, so what is the logic of this entire network? So we said basically that the, the total energy flowing to the neurons, to this side, should match the total input of the neuron, because input of the neuron determines its, its uh, energy demand factor. So the energy supply pattern should match energy demand pattern. So that's a common thing For that to happen, all this entire network should be trainable. Should be and it should be trained based on certain principles. Right? So we just make it as a hypothesis. And we have a whole bunch of other work I'm not showing here. The latest work of that kind is basically the experiment in the artificial networks. So something that artificial neurovascular networks, where there's a vascular network feeding energy into the neural network. That means the neuron can fire only with the energy supply into it. So if, since our energy is, the energy supply is, in, is limited, it's limited. I have to figure out how to distribute it across all these neurons in an optimal, optimal function. How do I do that? So for that, I need to train the vascular network also just like a time unit. That means the vascular network in the brain also becomes a learning system. It becomes information possible. It's not just a dumb variation system. It learns, it has intelligence. It probably has memory and it has you know, maps and all this. So, we've been talking on these lines for almost like 2009. Right? Uh, so, so, okay, so again and again, what we have been finding is that, you know, using very simple computation principles that can explain why the diversity of the mind. Right? Uh, so, maybe this, this agenda has to be expanded and we need to cover a lot of ground quickly. There are a lot of people who can do that. So, I'm open to collaboration for the students are interested, they can join. Uh, so what we are going to do is like this philosophy of modeling is to be summarized in three components. Simplify the infinite right? Basically, make the model so simple that you know, like I mentioned, when you said, you make it any simple, it's not absurd. Like okay, go to that point. And then how do you know that model is correct? We apply it to a hundred different phenomena and then make sure it will explain all. Then it is probably correct. So you need to do that. And once you have to be avoid the whole thing like that, right? Uh, you should have immense applications in both engineering and and so one thing we have done in this regard is to combine the automation unit culture, which is behind this whole AI revolution that you are seeing today. Our oscillators to because the physics models of theories are full of oscillations. I mean, from quantum to wave mechanics to classical mechanics. I mean, that's the substrate, right? So you combine that, it will become a very physical theory. It will connect the huge universe of AI models. With uh, physics based models and more biologically grounded models. So, I mean, that's we have to make some progress in this. So, with that, uh, we would like to build a whole oscillated area of the brain. There's a classic book by Georgi um, Bazaki, Presidents of the Brain, uh, which is like a you know, go to book, a gold standard for oscillated uh, neuroscience. So, we would like to work out all these different phenomena in some oscillated terms. And uh, actually, I would like to create centers with this flavor, that is. The core activity center is building this kind of big theories. By talking to all these different experimental groups and making sure the theory talks to and addresses and satisfies all the different groups. And out of that, make startups and then the publication. One of the old students have uh, worked on different projects in the lab, collaborative and district projects for the lab some years ago. Okay.
Okay, we got to see for a few. Did you talk? Uh, I think now we can pick up some questions. Sure. First, I'll start. Can, how do we understand coma? Coma. Uh, how do we understand? So usually it happens because of damage to deeper subcortical circuits. And there's still activity, but it's in low frequency. But beyond that, I right? So I know several people. Okay, we'll actually see. Okay. Uh, passing lecture, thank you. To what extent does heredity play a role in many of these major brain disorders, Parkinson's? Uh, it's mixed. So, for example, people try to because if you look at the genome evolution, right, the whole hope of genome evolution is once you work out the genes, I can solve all diseases. But we know we know the genetic uh, component of disease, but we haven't solved the disease, right? So, for example, if you take Parkinson's, so there are some 30 genes are involved, so which means it's not a strongly genetic disorder. That's why a lot of these disorders are called multifactorial disorders. Genetic is only one, this gives you a predisposition. But whether it actually manifests or not in the given patient depends on environmental factors and social experience and all those. They're not strongly genetic. The reason I ask is because I wonder if there are early indicators, <laughs> sorry, early indicators, and whether you know that's pursued in neuroscience to uh, not only inform uh, sort of the remedial treatment slash management, but uh, perhaps could completely avoid some of the larger consequences. Yeah, so like I said, I mean, these are not strongly genetic disorders. So that means there's something you can do epigenetically to counteract you know, and to compensate for that kind of predisposition. So I mean, that's where you have hope. But genetic is uh, somewhat fatalistic. It's in the genes, and so you're in school. Yeah, um, Sorry, how do you know these are not a lot of interesting principles of function? Like, what are the basic ideas that you can decide for a, the platform solution? Like, yeah, do you think that would change how we interpret data and how data is used to infer theories about you know, these general principles? Of yeah, it should. In fact, there's a lot of hope that it is. But what is happening now is uh, there's a lot of progress in the AI in these models, but uh, they don't look at brain much. So there's only a small group who, who are even uh, qualified or trained enough to, to, make, to, to conduct that conversation. So you see articles by, you know, uh, there's a popular article by Savage, which came in nature. But there's not much in it. I mean, I don't see much sugar at all. So, so if you look at a lot of AI models today, they are input output models. There's a network which is trying to detect some input produce model. Whereas if you want to understand when first of all it must be an agent model, it must be a self-contained system which will decide what to observe and how to react and how to know. It is a complete decision. So for that, uh, because you can go, go very far just by watching the map. On the AI side, not very much about it. But if you actually take the trouble to study brain, I think it will go fast. And it will also fall back into neuroscience, Greek and neuroscience, which is where I am much more interested. It can happen. But for that, there must be a conversation. It's not happening much. Just one more question. Throughout the talk, there is this theme that the brain is the brain, the mind is not the same. Mm -hmm. They get the struggles. They have a lot more ways to input information. Yeah. Sorry, so, 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 yeah. social interactions. Sorry, I can't. Social interactions, I mean, all these things also input Yeah. Like, it's not just the brain. So, um, when you talk about things like the detail and uh, the medicine that I've described to be, uh, there is probably some reasons why we need it because we don't have a big solution. Yeah. You know, like as a pharmacy problem. Yeah. But, there is also a solution and political ambiguity. A lot of this anxiety and 
mental health problems could also be the consequence of the kind of social life that we have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but where does the academic consensus, consensus come from? Like, so yeah. these are my types of No, my complaint is not about the drugs. But my complaint is uh, the what I'm trying to point out there is for lack of understanding, again, like that's what I want to show. I'm not saying you know, drugs are the solution. Right. So, lack of a conceptual framework first, so by the way, within which I can understand the disease first. I did it with the psychotherapy or the pharmacology, that's different. So, uh, so, we need to make progress in that as well, all the time. Yeah, because that's their hammer. They have tried to push that and they have you know, convince you that that's the only solution. I, I don't believe in that. Uh, I, I don't. Uh, but uh, one thing, my my personal feeling about this uh, way we approach psychiatry. If you look at the pre World War era, of last century, right? You have these masters like you know, Freud and you know, uh, morning parts of psychoanalysis. They used to talk in terms of, for example, uh, Jung talks about collective unconscious, right? Freud has this, you know, need need to live it over. So now, because of so because the collective unconscious is not something that you can measure, <laughs> so it's a very hypothesis of a collective unconscious will take away from materialism. So whereas the post uh, second one, you know, psychiatry is all since you want to be completely objective, there is obsession with objectivity, right? Because you only study something like psychics by definition subjective. You want to study it objectively, which means all that you can do is you know collect observations and measure and draw and pie charts and do statistics and all that. Because of that, I think they're throwing away the baby with the bathwater. So we'll be seriously limited in our approach to treatment because we want to objectivize something that is essentially, by definition, you know, private and subject. So there's a problem, there's a problem, there's a problem there, an obstacle we have to overcome. Something. So all the drugs and all that will have very iffy effect because fundamentally there's a foundation, there's a problem, there's a contradiction. But this is not how modern psychiatrists talk. I try to compose the people and look at I mean, what do you think of this fundamental idea about the master? For them, it's all statistics and DSM, we want to look for the. It's just uh, categorizing symptoms. So, no, fixation of objectivity and uh, objective. Treatment is fine. If you can show the positive results, I'm okay. It is a positive result. Comparing the analysis of the radio system and the The basic problem I find from that is not the biologist doesn't understand all these things. But in case of brain, brain is not a standalone system, it's being influenced by the Yeah. How does the your model, the approach will bring into the picture of the social activity in your society? That's being just influencing your brain of activity. How does your model that you I'll give two answers. One is uh, there's a very beautiful book called Vehicles by Breitenbach. Breitenbach is an anatomist. So generally, you want, you want to understand brain, you want to understand all its complexity, and therefore, it is, you understand its complex manifestations. It takes very simple concepts, like a vehicle which has two wheels and two centers to respond to environment. And what he wants to show is uh, a very simple system in its interaction with the complex environment can manifest complex behavior. The system itself doesn't have to be complex. So, okay, to answer your question, I think with the appropriately constrained network models, you borrow ideas from deep networks and but you constrain them with more biology. I think you can uh, model social interactions also effectively. But I haven't really done that. I have some ideas, but I haven't really done that. For example, family dynamics, right? Uh, I've read that in a family for the Parents get along, cannot get along well. Right? The kid has a high chance of becoming schizophrenic. Because mother says one thing, you know, it's a child impulsive, <laughs> that creates a division. So, those kinds of things I think can be, family dynamics can be modeled. In fact, I feel if we can develop such models, that they have Asian models of things, and study interaction in, in a close family members, 
it keeps them to much better country therapy. Yeah, yeah, because so you're constantly learning and you can reproduce the kind of conditions of learning of a child and understand family dynamics better and then give concrete suggestions to the parents and to, you know, it's about how to change the conditions at home. But it's a good startup idea, you know, to create somebody like this. Good. Uh, so your yeah, talk was very interesting and uh, you know, like several points is something which we don't uh, read about too much uh, in the newspapers. But uh, I just had a question to ask about the brain model uh, that you said you, you and several other scientists were developing and that eventually would have so many applications in the clinical sense. And I just want to know, do you think while developing the model, we can also, in conjunction that alongside that, also start developing uh, clinical treatments? Yeah. Or should we wait till the model no. is developed? Because no, I, uh, so, uh, I, I, I really read about like our sex here. Uh, yeah some uh, things that he's written about understanding different diseases and how he used a Parkinson's drug to treat uh, patients who have been uh, inflicted with encephalitis in the 1960s. So you could use different parts of that theory to uh, treat diseases. Yeah, excellent question. In fact, if somebody wants to know more about the story, watch the movie Awakenings. I read Robert De Niro and uh, so, based on other sacks now. So, by the way, uh, right. So, so that's what we done. So, because I know that if you the whole brain model takes 20 years to build on if you have to, nobody will fund that kind of thing. So, there are some problems going on internationally because they have hundreds of millions of dollars and they can afford that luxury. But I cannot afford that luxury. So, what we are doing is model separate parts of the brain which are connected to the existing diseases. And that you can finish in a shorter time. And then you develop applications and that will convince people to fund in other things. So what we are doing back is we have our model of business is very mature after these decades of three decades of work. So with that model, now we are creating this kind of a pipeline. So where we take this complete data from the patient, our model is already ready. We put this data into the model. That will create an artificial, like a virtual patient. Then whatever treatment you want to give to the patient, which uh, selection of drugs, uh, you want to do deep brain stimulation, what should be the current level frequencies and pattern of firing. All that is simulated in the model. And depending upon which uh, parameters are work best for that, you give it to the patient. Otherwise, right now what happens is uh, it's a bunch of thumbs and doctors go goes for a bunch of thumbs. So that we are just begun for this process. We have uh, had a couple of meetings with Ramchandra and Michael. And we got the ethics clearance on our side, they are getting it on this side. We'll start collecting data. So that's on the way. But you know, this uh, healthcare work is very slow. So you cannot just go and say, okay, change your protocol and start you know, doing it for patients. It's not easy to get, get through a lot of clearances. Yes, Also, a question regarding the how much do we understand the process of memory? I think there would have to be a molecular basis to it if we have to understand it very well. And where are we in understanding the whole process? So, like with everything, excellent question. Like with everything else in the brain, memory is also a network. You know, there are molecular players, right, supporting it. Ultimately, it's a network. You know. And if you look at the journey of memory, uh, memory comes through information comes to senses. And it goes into hippocampus, the so cortex hippocampal circuit. And it's stored there for a short time, for hours or days or so on. And then it's shipped out to long term stores in pretty much the entire cortex. It's not, people just say long term stores in the cortex, but people don't exactly brain. This happens in sleep stages, deep sleep stages. So, by a very complicated, uh, you know, like a programming cycle. So, you can. Book, so this is called memory consolidation. The hippocampal side is uh, there's a lot of knowledge on that. But uh, what happens to long-term source nowadays transmitted? I don't think there's a good thing. Especially in how it is actually stored for some time. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Now, there will be molecules at play at, uh, at, at smaller scales, but uh, uh, how so when in a computer, for example, you're showing memory in hard disk, there are molecules at play, but mostly it is at level of, uh, at, let's say, consistent voltage states, right? You don't worry about molecule, I mean, molecule level there. Information stored at level of the transistor and some you know, voltage states or switch states. So here also it's a question of what is happening at the network level and what is the input. Uh, from my understanding, uh, what I see is that uh, this Miso brain idea and uh, this uh, model thing is uh, really important. Uh, but uh, my doubt is that uh, I don't know about Parkinson, but uh, regarding other multifactorial diseases, disorders that you were talking about, uh, if the same thing has to be done for uh, uh, done to get the prediction or uh, you know the prescription for the patient, that is what this model is going to predict. Like right? if we are going to see the uh, the uh, we are going to capture the symptoms of the patient and input into the model, see how it uh, uh, reacts to our treatment, and then if it is okay, uh, then we are going to implement the other yeah. So if this is going to uh, be implemented for manufacturing uh, disorders, yeah. uh, then the prediction that we obtain for the model is going to be uh, only uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, percentage of effect of the patient, right? Like, yeah. uh, the effect if the patient is more uh, um, uh, affected by the social factors, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, this, the factor that is uh, uh, playing with the brain, uh, uh, this is going to produce only a per per percentage of uh, positive effect of something. So, so we can tell the patient the same question. Maybe we can tell the subject saying, look, you know, this associations or the social factors are giving you the problem. Get it or change the quality of the interaction and that should improve it. You can suggest that. So that should be possible. That should be possible to write it. It's possible to write yeah, Professor, I, I really enjoyed the talk and uh, uh, your points and uh, what we as Namachan even says is, is well taken. But I would like to just push back and say that a lot of the cost uh, that, you know, the hundreds of billions of dollars are going in creating instruments to measure, uh, measure, to take measurements, right? Like for developing the MRI, like the Savant Nobel Laureate that was led to the development of the MRI, which you are using in your model. So the creating the model or, or creating a conceptual framework is made possible only by development of these tools. Even the back work, even 3D spatial uh, back uh, uh, model, it's so difficult to uh, to do that experiment with, uh, on the on a back, right? Like, as in like, uh, put these electrodes in. It. So I, I think the I think the point is that uh, the the, uh, the the data acquisition or the the equivalent of the Galilean telescope. Today, our telescopes are our instruments are more expensive. Like that. like if you take a physics example, it will be the uh, the collider project, like which which it's not possible to do by a single person. Correct. So yeah, the same question. This is actually the problem. What an argument we have always in our department. You have scientist people and the competition people. So, but what I'm all the time saying is these things must go hand in hand. I should know when to stop in the sense, like you know, you have single photon microscopy, okay, you got some data. And oh, this is not good enough, we need higher resolution, I go for two photons. Or oh, this is not sufficient, I want to go for three photons. My question is, what have you done with the single photon results in the first place? So if these things don't go hand in hand, there is never an end, there is never enough. Right? So what you have actually have is like a you know, it's a, sorry to say constipation of data. Infinite amount of data, and you have no. Actually, what I feel is if you even have half a operating theory, and I don't need to do so many experiments, right? I keep telling you, I had this argument with the MIT postdoc in one of the neuroscience labs. Look, I mean, I told him, look, I take a pen and I draw it. Okay, then I take a kerchief and I draw it, take a coin and draw it. And they're all falling in the same way, 900 meters per second square. How many times you have to do the experiment to see a lot of, of gravitation force? I mean, after some people are dropping, I'm sorry for the pun. I'm done. 
I know that I see the pattern. After that, if you have the time and patience, you can keep on doing the experiment. So once you see the theoretical essence of it, you know when to experiment that uh, uh, something, right? So if you don't know that, you don't have any reckoning of that, there's never an end. So what is happening in the is People are, you know, there's always normal uh, like equipment to design, or it's not able to collect, and uh, there's no application of thought to the corresponding theoretical aspect. Well, Kiri is cheap. We're just talking to Vibo on the belt here. And he has hands had a lot of insta things and all that. like, all that I need is a bunch of notebooks and friends. Right? That's how cheap. Let us look at the $100 billion, $100 billion uh, the project. I don't know the name, but a lot of criticism about the projects. Right? What have you guys done? What are you giving to the society with so much money? It's an expense. So, this, you know, fundamentally it's correct argument. But look at the numbers and the actual proportions, and it's very difficult to justify. Right? And like I said, 30,000 people attend the conference every year. Right? What is some of it? I mean, my uncles and Chacha are an artist and Mokri, they're all, oh, okay, there's some problem and there's no cure. So at some point, the uh, citizens are all ordinary human beings, right? Uh, we'll ask this question. If I was telling this lady that I met on the ferry in San Francisco Bay, you should talk to the government, look, what are you doing for me? My husband has been wheelchair, you know, someone in wheelchair for 18 years, and I've been filling the road. Filling the Excellent point. I, 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 under, I agree with uh, what you're arguing with. But I, I, I also feel like uh, whenever engineers, you know, like even the Intel uh, CEO said, uh, went in and said, like, uh, we we find the polymer to solve, to solve cancer. And, uh, and, you know, like people like Jeff, Jeff Hawkins, the engineers who have gotten into neuroscience or into medicine, they find it hard. Like, what, at a point, uh, the, the problem with your is fundamentally hard. So that's also, I think Jeff Hopkins put his entire, uh, uh, he, all, his, all his money into uh, trying to come up with the theory. And uh, it's no, I mean, his theory is not uh, in a thousand frame theory. I read the book and uh, it, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's not its limitations in a way. See, that's the, that's the thing about theory. Once, until you have the right theory, it's hard. But once you have it, it just needs brains. That's the thing. You cannot put money and get the right theory. So you can put the money and get more data, better equipment, but you cannot put money and get a get a SI Newton. But once Newton comes on the on the scene, two years he sits in a corner in Bullstock in a small village and works on the whole thing. Millennia of astronomical data is all solved, it's uh, transparent. Right? That magic has to happen. I mean, how it happens, I don't know. Which I think it's possible to happen. Uh, yes, hello, Professor. I really enjoyed this seminar, especially your viewpoint on how research and research we tend to get lost in data instead of focusing on the bigger picture as in we have to develop uh, some special theories based on the data. Um, seeing that you are a computational neuroscientist, I just wanted your view on Penrose's or OR theory of consciousness. Oh yeah, sorry to say I read that book. I tried to read that book. I couldn't make head of it about it. And quantum gravity are way beyond my. I'm just trying to understand the basic quantum sure. mechanics. By quantum mechanics. Shadows of the mind. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and Emperor's new clothes. Way yeah. beyond. I should come to you guys here. Love this. So, okay. in essence, uh, he says that um, consciousness is not something that can be computed. What are your views? I have no idea. But I like the work of Edelman and Tonani. And that's our, my most favorite uh, theory of consciousness. Basically, what they say is consciousness is not a question of intensity of brain activity, but the complexity of brain. So we actually compute and propose some measure of information or complexity measure. And find that when that is sufficiently high, the person becomes conscious. So if you take brain data and compute this measure, uh, this measure uh, in, for example, in the state of deep sleep, or in the state of anesthesia, or in the state of epileptic seizure, so in seizure, the activity levels are very high, but the complexity measure is low. The person is unconscious. And it's very convincing piece of work, but awfully there's some criticism saying that it's not, uh, there's some you know, uh, shortcoming or something like that. But I think it's possible to take a quantitative uh, theoretical based approach to consciousness also. But uh, I think the complete theory is still lacking. Thank you. Okay, well, well, well. Uh, uh, last, last, last I came to the lecture and uh, just to complete it all, and I know you're in the computation of science and uh, I'm in the clinical side. And uh, neuroscience is the technique that about most conventional 
a lot of money being put in, but there's very little coming out in the output. So as a computation science, what do you think is the best, uh, the most data and you think most relevant data produce some kind of the logistics that you think in the near future? Because you know Parkinson's to be a lot of money has been put in the lot of science. There's not really much as far as patient care can be a huge change. Which do you think in from your laboratory starts? Do you think that maximum research will be done in the next month? Which should probably even put uh, some air into the research that you can. That's it, question. And that was the soul of my talk. Basically, if you the problem is not to get you know get more data here is in this now. The problem is to get that fundamental conceptual framework for that of that part of the brain, which is not medicine. So if it's Parkinson, you can understand how basic it works. In fact, I find that you know only of late I'm becoming more and more aware of this side of medicine. For example, if you, if you please correct me if I'm wrong. If you look at MD neurology, for example, or MD psychiatrism, they teach you about all sorts of disorders and how to treat them, but not how brain works normally. Right? Correct me if I'm wrong. So in physics, uh, there's no equivalent. I mean, you study how systems work normally, and uh, in engineering, you study how the products and they are damaged. But in, in medicine, you study only a damaged brain. I, right? But they, you are never taught how a normal brain works. So, for example, you want to treat Alzheimer's. They tell you how to do it, XYZ. They don't tell you how does the brain uh, organize its memories, a normal brain. So, how can you fix a car, for example, without understanding how it normally works? Right, so it's a very fundamentally the approach itself is very different from the way we do in engineering. So, so what I'm saying is to solve this problem because again and again you are seeing the hundreds of examples, tons of money poured in and nothing much coming out is a very common uh, in the story of uh, contemporary clinical neurosurgery. I think we need to figure out the basic understanding conceptual framework first, and that can be done with whatever computation tools and theories available. You repackage them and modify them and later. Fashion them a little bit and turn them in this direction. Uh, you can get the understanding very quickly, right? And then you know what to measure and why you want to measure. You know what is relevant, what is just noise. Without that, if you keep on measuring everything, you will be lost. It will be quite intimidating. Data will be so complicated. Once you do that, I think uh, every one of these different uh, you know, uh, disorders, there is a uh, work on them, become more logical, and you will see outcomes coming out right, in a more reasonable fashion. Otherwise, it will be a lot of wasted. And it's, it's, you can easily understand it. I think a physicist will understand it very easily. But a biologist won't understand it. They, you know, in fact, my colleagues, you don't know biology, you know, you're in there, you're Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we have some time so uh, good evening anybody uh, thank you for the lecture so somebody was wondering it's uh, eye opening but uh, in my opinion it is uh, open to your brains so i had a feeling that all along uh, the scientific community or scientific brains were busy in the study of other things and bother to study the brain itself so what is as uh, I understand from this uh, lecture, process lecture, many faculties have to come together and uh, find out a solution. I don't know whether the solution is AUC or it's a question of uh, priority. So thank you very much, uh, Professor. Thank you. And uh, thank you all the participants. Thank you. 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 Thank you, uh, yeah, thank you for guiding us. Thank you, and uh, please join us for the uh, refreshment outside. Thank you. So, uh, I am privileged to hand over a, a copy of the uh, general matter. Uh, that is Children's Science uh, Observatory. It's a publication of uh, Tamil Nadu Science Forum. One more magazine is there. That is truly uh, in Tamil language. Thank 